Okay, uh, first of all, thanks for coming to this session in which we will discuss uh, serverless and more specifically Java within the serverless space. So, uh, before we do that, some logistics. So, um, my name is David de la Basse. Uh, I work at Oracle. I live in Belgium on the French speaking side of Belgium. So, despite my French accent, I'm not French, but I'm uh, from Belgium. But still, you will have to bear with me with that funky French accent. Uh, this was me uh, in a conference in Sweden, and someone in the audience tweeted that it's not a real conference unless you read Oracle's Seferber statement at least once. So, here it is. And last but not least, so I'm using one of the, I'm using a, a MacBook, MacBook Pro with the, those new funky keyboards. And uh, if you have been following the news, uh, you might have seen a lot of complaints about that keyboard. And in fact, uh, Apple has issued a new, well, a fix for, a fourth fix for that keyboard last week, and people are complaining that it still doesn't work. So I'm using that keyboard, so if anything breaks during my demo today, it's not me, it's because of the keyboard. And I'm serious. So, serverless. So let's discuss serverless. So first of all, I need to clarify what we mean by serverless. So each time I'm going to say serverless today, I really mean function as a services, because in itself serverless is a wide and broad term. So I'm really talking about function as a services. So what is function as a services? Well, first of all, at the core of us, we have this notion, this notion of a function, a function being a small piece of code that will perform one task. So the function will get something in input that will trigger the function execution, and uh, once the execution is done, most of the time, the function will produce some kind of output. So it's not necessarily in function as we have in mathematics in the sense that the function might have some side effects, like putting a result in a cache, for example. A new developer will basically spend your, most of your time in uh, writing a function. So the function is basically the fundamental unit of design, but also the fundamental uni unit of deployment and also uh, of uh, billing. We then have this as, a, this as a services piece, which is basically the compute element on which your function will run on. So it's basically the platform that you will run your function on. So the, the idea is that you as a developer write function and then you give those function to a fast platform provider. And it's up to the fast platform provider to make sure that everything works. So that includes provisioning the platform, installing and maintaining the platform, securing the platform, scaling the platform, and so on and so on. So we can easily distinguish two, two types of responsibility, two roles. We have on one hand function developers, and on the other hand we have fast platform providers. So that's basically what uh, FAS is all about. Now, there are a lot of, dis well, a lot of discussions regarding uh, function as a services versus containers. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because if you look under the hood, all the FAS platforms are using a container as a, a basic uh, building block. And we can clearly see that there are a lot of momentum in the market for serverless and more specifically, specific, specifically for FAST. So the question that I would like to discuss today is what about uh, Java within the, within the serverless space? So what is and where is Java within the function as a services world today? So uh, first we know that Java is a very popular and widely, widely used programming language. Um, depending on where you look at, it's either the first uh, most used programming language or the second most used programming language, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. We can all agree that Java is widely used and since many years. So what about Java within the serverless space? Well, we don't have a lot of metrics and the few metrics that we have about the Java usage within the serverless space are not that good. So this is a survey that was conducted by the serverless frameworks. So the serverless framework is basically an abstraction that you can write function on top of different fast platform providers. And you can use different programming language to write those functions. So the serverless frameworks basically ask the user, okay, what are you using today to write uh, your function? And you see this big uh, green arc, that's node six. So just above 70%. If you had that to uh, that purple box, which is Node 4, uh, over 75% of the users are using Node and hence JavaScript to write serverless function, at least on the, uh, using the serverless frameworks. Then we have Python 3.6, 9.5%. Uh, if you add that to Python 2.7, that's basically 17% of users are using Python. And Java, that's basically this small yellow uh, 
blocks that we have at the top, which is not even 5%, it's 4.96. So clearly, uh, it's not that great, right? So that was the first question, and the second question was, okay, we know that you're using that language today, but what do you plan to use in the future? And basically, well, you see that Java doesn't really increase. It basically stays flat around 5%. That's the around line that we have uh, there. So the few metrics that we have regarding the Java usage within the function as a services space are not that good, right? So how can we explain that? Don't, that on one hand, we have a very popular programming language, and on the other hand, we have this new emerging space where clearly Java doesn't seem to be widely used, at least yet. So first, we need to look at the historical fast landscape. It's a pretty new landscape. And if we look at the three major fast platforms, well, we have Amazon. I think that for Amazon, uh, it's, well, it's okay because we're supporting Java since quite some time, June 2015. We then have Microsoft. Microsoft is only supporting Java since February this year. So it's a pretty new offering, right? And then we have Google, and Google only supports Java, Java 8, since April. So it's pretty new, but it's still in alpha, so it's not even a GA. So the fact that if we look at the major fast, pl the ma the major fast platform providers, except for Amazon, the other two doesn't really have a good Java story, at least today. So that might explain why Java is not very popular yet in that space. Then, uh, given that the serverless and the fast space is pretty new, one of the observations that we see on the market is that basically uh, uh, startups are using any kind of technology to basically build their services. And it's only when their services need to, needs to, uh, uh, to grow, need to scale, need to be more robust that they are switching to Java. So we might uh, expect that some serverless developers today, I'm going to use that one. Uh, we might expect that some uh, serverless developers today uh, will switch over time to Java when they need to scale. Yeah, I think it works. Now, there are also, there are also uh, there might be some te technical reason why Java is not used within the serverless space, at least not widely. Maybe Java is, not ju is just not a good fit for writing serverless function. Um, if you look at the history of Java, Javi, Java has been designed basically to uh, has been designed and tuned to uh, run long-running applications, and functions uh, are by nature ephemeral. So they will be invoked, they will live for 100 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, one or two seconds, and then they will die. Maybe Java is not a good fit for writing such a short-lived uh, application. So that might explain why Java uh, is not used for writing serverless function. So at Oracle, when we started to work on our fast platform, we basically set some of our goals that we want to achieve with uh, our fast uh, platform. And obviously, being Oracle, we wanted to make sure that Java was a first-class citizen on top of our fast platform. So uh, th those are some of the requirements that we set to ourselves for our fast platform. So we want to have the ability to use plain old Java. We want to give the ability to, fast develop to function developers to keep using the tool they are using today. Um, Functions are stateless, ephemeral, but we still want to have the ability to write more advanced applications. Finally, we also have to deal with the, the, the short latency that we expect with uh, functions. And last but not least, we also have the rich uh, Java virtual machine ecosystem that we need to make sure we are able, able to cope with. So, um, Oracle is contributing to an open source fast platform that is called FN. FN stands for function, so it's open source, container native meaning that uh, ev everything in FN is basically a container. So a function in FN uh, is a container, and this is exposed. Now, as a function developer, you don't need to understand how it works. So the only thing that you're providing to the platform is basically the code of your function, and it's then up to the platform to turn that into a container. So it's open source, Apache V2, everything is on GitHub. And the nice thing about that is that uh, you can take FN, uh, you can run it on your laptop. That's very convenient for development, for example. You can also take FN and run it in any type of cloud. So obviously, uh, Oracle Function, which is the, fast, the managed uh, fast platform of Oracle, is using FN under, under the hood. But you can also use FN on top of the or Oracle Cloud, or you can also use FN on Amazon, on Google. It doesn't really matter. It's up to you to, to decide which, uh, which way you want to go. Having said that, obviously, if you are running so if you take FN and if you run FN on someone else's cloud, 
That also means that you will have to manage the platform. So you will have to deal with the two roles. You will be the function developer, but you will also be uh, the fast platform provider. But if you understand that, that's perfectly fine. So technically, FN is written in Go. It makes sense. At the end of the day, it's an infrastructure project such as Kubernetes or Docker. Uh, but as I said, we wanted to make sure that uh, Java works nicely on top of FN. So let's have a look at uh, FN. So what I have here, I have re FN running on my machine. The only thing that you need uh, is Docker. So if I look at Docker, it's empty. So I'm going to start FN, FN start minus D, so detached mode. And that will basically uh, spin up uh, FN server container in my Docker. So now I have FN running in my machine. So to interact with FN, I'm using this uh, FN uh, CLI, which basically allows me to do everything. So I'm going to use the FN CLI to bootstrap a Java function, given the context. So FN init, runtime, Java. And then I need to give my function a name. Let's call it Duke. So if we look at the file that have been created, um, well, we do have a few files. So first of all, we have a hello function, which is basically a simple hello world serverless Java function that you will extend. We also have this hello function test, which is basically a function that is using JUnit to unit test our uh, serverless function. And then we have this func.yaml, which is just a file containing some metadata about the function itself like the name of the function, the version of the function, the runtime, the image that we are using. So we are using two types of image, one that is using a GDK to build the function, and another one that will be used to run the function. And obviously, to run the function, we are only using a GRE. But again, that's not something that you have to, to deal with. That's something that is managed by the platform. And the thing that we have here is basically our serverless function, so at the bottom. And given that it's a Java function, it's basically uh, a simple class. So this is the, our class, come example fn hello function. And this is the, the method, so the Java method within our classes. And if you look here, you can also see that we have a pom.xml. So basically, a serverless Java function is fn is simply a Maven project. So. Given that it's a Maven project, we can obviously test our function. So Maven test. And so the function is built locally, and it's test, and obviously uh, everything works. So the next thing that we want to do is basically to run the function. So for that, we need to create an application. An application is simply a namespace. So it's basically a way to group together related function. So again, I'm going to use the the CLI, so fn create app, and let's call it uh, BCN. So if I look now at the apps that I have on my context, I have a bunch of apps, and I'm going to use the BCN apps. So I can look in BCN, so fn list function BCN, and it should be empty, and it is. So now I'm going to deploy my uh, Duke function, so BCN. I don't have to specify which function I want to deploy because it will pick up the local func.yaml that we have. And what I'm going to do, just to save some time, I'm going to use this local flag and I'm going to add the verbose, flag, the verbose flag so that we can see what happened behind the scenes. And well, you see that whenever we build a function, sorry, when it, whenever we uh, deploy a function, obviously we have to build it. And you see that under the hood, Maven is being used given that it's Java function. So Maven is used to produce an artifact, and then it's a multi-stage build. So you see here that basically our artifact, so our, our function is being uh, put within a given uh, runtime Docker image. So our function is now uh, deployed, so we can invoke it. So fn invoke uh, the app and the function. Hello world, it's pretty basic. We have the ability to pass it some payload. Uh, BCN, FN invoke uh, BCN, so that's the app, and that's uh, the function Duke. Hello BCN. Oh, no, let's let's do something else. So right now I'm running my function, so I'm deploying my function locally on my laptop. So that means that everything is running locally. Obviously, at the end of the day, you want to deploy the function within a fast platform running in the cloud. So to that. We just need to switch context, and I'm going to use um, an Oracle Cloud context now. So it's a data center running in the US. And if I look at the apps that I have there, 
I should have the, no, sorry, if I use context OCI, sorry, I said context. Oh, the, the, well, the BCN app was already created, so let's create another one, and let's call it uh, GPCN. And I say create app GPCN. So now we're going to deploy, well, we're going to deploy the same function to GPCN. Uh, here I'm reviewing the dash dash local, basically, each time we deploy a function, we need to push that, that Docker image. So the CLI need to push that Docker image to a, a registry. And obviously, given that everything is remote, I need to make sure now that I push that uh, image. And you see that this is the last step. So uh, my function is being pushed to, my, uh, to the registry that is, that is being used there. So now, if I inspect uh, the GBCN app and the function is Duke, I think, I said SPFN inspect function. Well, you see that I have a remote HTTP endpoints that I can use to basically invoke my function. So if I do something like this, oh, yeah, it's a post. Uh, minus X, uh, I think it's post. You see, hello world. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm invoking my function through HTTP, my function that is re uh, running uh, in a data center in the US. Um, we can also define HTTP triggers or different type of triggers, so different means of invoking our function. So I'm going to switch back to a local context just to save some time. So if I can use context local, so now I'm again using FN server running locally. So it's a Maven project, so let's look at the code very quickly. So for that I'm going to use IntelliJ, but obviously you can use Eclipse or uh, NetBeans. So the project is imported. Um, okay, here it is. So Duke source. Uh, so this this is the class that is used to test my function, and this is the function itself. So you see, it's pretty basic. It's basically uh, a Java method that that gets a string and it produces a string in uh, in output. What you should see here is that there is no annotation, there is no interface. It's really plain old Java, right? So what we can do, we can create a new type, so an event, private. Um, name. So an event has a name and a date. I need a constructor. I need a default constructor and I need a getter and setter. So I've just created a new very basic uh, Java type. So what I'm going to do here next, I'm going to basically create a new object of that type and we're going to use the input and today's date as the date. And I'm going to return that so it doesn't work because obviously we need to update the signature to return that type. So now our uh, serverless function has changed. So it will get a string and it will produce this new uh, event type, which is just a Java type that I've, I have created. So um, to use the, the, this to use this function, which whoops, we need to deploy it again, and this time it's to the GBCN apps, given that it's local. So uh, fn deploy minus minus app and oh I was on the wrong context so fn create app bcn okay so do, this will take some time because the function needs to be rebuilt. Okay, and it doesn't work. Anybody has a guess why it doesn't work? Yeah, the test. So each time we build a function, obviously we test the function. And well, my tests obviously are failing, so we need to fix the test.
It will work, you'll see. So you see the tests have been fixed. Uh, clearly, that's, that's, well, you can only fix the test that way when you're on stage in front of an audience. So don't do that at home, right? Uh, so let's, n let's now uh, invoke that function again. So uh, let's see, uh, minus n, g, b, c, n, f, n, invoke, uh, b, c, n, and the function was duke, I think. Let's g, g q that. And this is now the outcome of the, of the serverless function. So it produced this, this event type, and obviously the only way to produce out that type is to use, uh, to use uh, a JSON. But the nice thing is that on the Java side, again, it's plain all Java. Uh, I didn't have to specify that I want this to be converted to a uh, JSON payload. And obviously, that's something that I can use in output, but also uh, in input for any serverless function. And given that it's a Maven project, I can import any kind of Java dependency uh, through Maven. I mean, it's really plain old Java, as usual. So, th this is possible because we have multiple function development kits. So, I was using the Java uh, FDK, that provide me Maven support, that provide me uh, GUnit support, that provide me input and output coercion, and so on and so on. So we are providing multiple FDK, including a Java one. So we have a Go one, we have a Node FDK, and so on and so on. So the ability to use plain old Java, yes, I think that you can agree that I was using plain old Java, and I just kept uh, using my uh, tool chain, so Maven and uh, IntelliJ. Now let's quickly talk about the ability to build complex applications. So remember that um, by nature functions should be stateless because functions are ephemeral. So that, uh, I mean holding the state within a function will just be too expensive. So if you need to hold some kind of state, you need to hold it outside of the function. Having said that, there is a use case where it makes sense to hold the state, the, the state within a function. And that is when you want to compose together multiple functions. So you, Think the following, you have a function that will invoke another function. This is asynchronous given that we are going through the network, so it might take some time. Uh, the main function is waiting for the result of that invocation, and once it has the result, it will maybe invoke another function, and so on and so on. And also, something might break. So the main function will basically have to deal with that. So for that, in FN, we have flow. And we have an, an, an FN flow API to handle that kind of orchestration scenario. Technically, uh, it's highly inspired from the completion stage API of Java AC. So in Java AC, in the platform, we have this API that allows us to define a pipeline execution of asynchronous tasks. FNflow is basically the same, except that obviously uh, the completion stage, everything happens within uh, the same process, within the GVM. Here, given that we're invoking a function, we're going through the network. But from a programming standpoint, it doesn't matter because uh, everything is hidden uh, uh, away uh, through the API. So this is how it looks like. So uh, first we have, the first line we are creating a flow object, so basically that's an object that will contain the result of an asynchronous invocation in the future. So the next line we are creating this pipeline execution, this one is pretty basic, so the only thing that it does, it invokes a remote function, so a func is basically a remote function, and the, 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 the so that, 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 that's basically the stage. So we are defining the pipeline there, but we are not doing anything. We are just defining the, the, the pipeline itself. It's only when we do a trigger that we are basically triggering the pipeline uh, execution. So to illustrate that, I have a, a very simple demo where basically the idea is to book some trips. So whenever we book a trip, we want to book a flight, we want to book an hotel, and we want to book a car. So for that, I have multiple backend functions written in Java, Ruby, uh, Node. And finally, once we have booked a trip, we also want to send a notification to the user. Uh, and this one is, done, uh, is written using Python. So we're going to uh, play with this, uh, the, this trip booking function that is basically doing the function of orchestration. So it doesn't matter that all the backend functions are written using different language than Java. The only thing, the, the only thing that, is, uh, that we're looking at is the Java uh, side of the trip booking function. So that's the flow API. So, so if we look at the apps that I have, I have the travel apps, and if I look in the travel apps, I should have a bunch of functions. So to book car, to cancel a car booking, to send an email, and so on and so on. And what I'm gonna invoke is the trip function, which is at the bottom, and for that, 
Now let's see. For that, I have some sample payload. So this is some sample payload that I'm passing to the trip booking function to basically uh, start the booking. Uh, before we do so, I need to start a few containers. So I'm starting three additional containers. So now I have four. Now, again, I'm taking my fast platform provider hat. As a function developer, you don't need to, uh, to do that. But there are only two containers that are really needed. FN server, obviously, and the flow server. That's basically the, the services that will maintain the, scale, the state of the orchestration of function. I have two additional containers that are just uh, used to see what's going on uh, during uh, my demo. Uh, let's just configure the app. So, now let's invoke if I invoke, uh, the application is travel and the function is trip. Uh, the thing is that it's not highly visual, so that's why I have those additional containers that will help us to see what's going on. So this is one of the tools that, uh, that, that has been started. So let's invoke that and let's switch here. And well, we can see that basically uh, we are booking a flight, we are booking an hotel, we are booking a car, and finally we are sending an email. So basically when invo we are invoking all those uh, functions to basically book a trip. Now you see that, well, five seconds is quite expensive, right? It's because, well, basically uh, the infrastructure was, uh, was called. But if we invoke again the same booking, uh, it's way faster. Why? Because if you see the platform uh, is keeping uh, the container of those function hot for a given amount of time to make sure that if we have a new request coming for those containers, we are basically reusing, reusing the containers that is already there. So that's the happy path. But obviously, uh, we are going through the network, so things can go wrong. So I have these additional tools that I can use to basically... So. So this tool is used to basically break my demo. So anytime I'm going to try to book a car, it will just fail. So I'm not able to book a car. So let's invoke this one again. And we will have a different behavior. So, well, we book a flight, we book an hotel, but you see that we can't book a car. So basically, what we are doing here through uh, using the Flow uh, API, we're we are in we are implementing some kind of transaction management. It's not distributed transaction. Uh, it's basically an implementation of the Saga patterns, where we basically roll back locally all the bookings that we have done. And we are doing that using the Flow API. So that was a very quick overview of the uh, FN Flow um, in action. And all that code is on GitHub, so you should uh, check it out. So ability to, ability to build complex application with serverless Java, yes, using FNflow. Having said that, it's only when you need to compose together multiple functions. Don't use FNflow to write any kind of generic uh, uh, application. It's not meant for that. Now let's, let's discuss about uh, these, uh, all the latency that we might expect whenever we are uh, using serverless function. Because we, well, Java has this bad reputation of having a very slow startup time. So whenever we have serverless Java function running in a container, that basically means that we want that uh, container to start fast, fast. So there are multiple things that we can do. Uh, but the first thing that I want to uh, quickly talk about is uh, about Java that needs to respect the resource constraint whenever it runs within the containers. So I'm not going to go in details about that slide. It's very busy, and it's not even complete. But the, the takeaway of that is basically, if you're looking at the Java evolution since Java 8, you can see that uh, we are basically investing to make sure that Java can work nicely when it runs within uh, containers. And uh, that's something that is important. So for example, if you look at the GVM, the Java Virtual Machine, it has this ability to auto-tune itself based on basically the environment it runs on. So the GVM will, will look at some metrics like the number of CPU, the memory available, and so on. And basically, it will try to tune itself so that it can work slightly within those constraints. If you are using a, an old version of Java, you, the GVM will basically not see that it runs within containers. So it will use the metrics coming from the host. 
and you can, uh, if you are doing that, you can be sure that things will go bad very quickly. So regardless of the fact that you are using uh, serverless Java, whenever you are running Java in containers, make sure to use a recent version of the GVM. Anyway, the takeaway of that, since Java 8, so Java 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, we are making the investment to make sure that Java can work nicely within containers. And that's something that we are leveraging, obviously, on the serverless side. So what about the startup time of a Java application? Something that we can use is CDS. So CDS, class data sharing, is something that is in the platform since Java SE 5. So each time you start a Java application, basically your jar is unpacked and all the class uh, needs to be brought into, into an in-memory representation. So basically the GVM will go through the byte code, will do scanning, security scanning, and so on. So a lot of operation needs to happen. And the thing is that obviously you have a, a bunch of classes. So that is a quite expensive operation. The idea of CDS is basically that work is done once, and once all the classes uh, are in memory, the GVM is taking an in-memory snapshot of that and dump it to disk. So the next time your application is started, the GVM will just bring directly that uh, in the memory, uh, in memory, in fact. And that's, that will basically speed up at least the startup time by 25%. So since Java SE5, we can do that for uh, classes, so the, uh, the old runtime classes, so rt.jar. Uh, since Java 10, we, we can also use application CDS. Basically the same tricks, but for the classes of our own applications. So that's something that uh, we are leveraging on the serverless side uh, to reduce the startup time of uh, serverless Java function. Now, startup time, we we'll need to think about the fact that our Java serverless function are running within containers. As a, as a developer, you don't necessarily need to worry about that because we are trying to handle as much as we can uh, on the tooling side. But at the, other, at the end of the day, we need to think about the different layers that we have in our containers. So basically, we have three layers. The operating system layer, the Java runtime layer, and then the Java function layer that also includes its dependency. At that layer, clearly, the, there is not much that we can do. The only thing that we can uh, say is basically, well, we can give you advice. Make sure, well, check your dependency. Make sure that you are not using any transitive dependency that are not needed, and so on and so on. But at the Java runtime and at the OS layers, there are things that we are doing. So the first thing that we're looking at is basically we are using, at using a, a more lightweight Linux distribution that is, running, that is using uh, Muscle instead of glibc. So basically glibc is the, the library that is used between the GVM, which is written in C++, and uh, the operating system. Um, we are looking at using Alpine, which is using Muscle. So it's used a different uh, libc than the standard uh, GTK distribution. But if we do that, we basically have the ability to use a, a, a Linux distribution that is highly optimized and that weighs less than five uh, megabytes. So a complete Linux distribution that we can use to run our function that weighs less than five megabytes. So that works. Having the ability to run Java on top of muscles instead of libc is being done within the project Portola, so under the OpenGDK uh, pro uh, project. The next thing that we can do is basically look at the Java runtime layer. So you know that since Java 9, we have modularity within the platform, and we have these jailing tools that give us the ability to basically build a custom GRE. So a GRE that will only have the modules that our code needs. So to give you some idea on what the benefit we can expect by using jailing, a whole GDK 12 weight 300 and let's say 20 megabytes. So the first thing, if you are running Java function, don't use a GDK. There are plenty of things in, your, in, in the GDK that you don't need to run the function. Use a GRE. But again, that's something that we handle for you. So you will never run a function within FN with a GDK. That's a very bad idea. There is no per se GDK 12 uh, GRE. But to give you some idea, I took the GRE 11, which weighed 200 and uh, let's say 20 megabytes. So just by switching from the GDK to a GRE, we already save 100 megabytes. Not, not only that, uh, from a security point of view, it's also a good idea. We don't want to have functions that carry bits that will never be run. At some point in time, those bits might be uh, potential vulner vulnerabilities. So the goal, obviously, is to use JLink to build a custom GRE. So again, to have an idea, starting point, a GRE uh, using JLink, uh, that includes all the modules, weight 168 megabytes. Now, it's, 
it's a very stupid idea to have a GRE that includes all the modules because we, are, we can be sure that, well, I don't think that there is a technical way to write, to write any meaningful application that is using all the modules. But this is just to give us some idea. Now, we can also remove some information from the GRE that are not necessarily needed, like the main page, the header files, and so on. So if you are doing that, we save another uh, 25 megabytes. So we are done 243 megabytes. Uh, we have two levels of compression. Compression two is zip deflate. So uh, if we do that, we basically save another 60 megabytes. So from 143, we are down to 83 megabytes. Obviously, at the end of the day, we want to build a GRE that is using only the modules that are needed by our serverless function. If we are doing that, our function will be done uh, from 168 to 47 megabytes, which is obviously a lot. Obviously, we have the ability to again remove uh, header files and so on, 41 megabytes. And then if we compress that to the max, 32 megabytes. So basically, by using JLink, we can go down through 168 megabytes for a GRE that includes all the modules, to down to 32 megabytes. Now, given that we're talking about the startup time of our Docker image, the idea is that we want to have Docker image that has super light. Because whenever we need to start a function, we basically, the, the platform needs to to load from the registry that function. So that's why we don't want to have 100 megabytes uh, large function. Now, uh, if you look at the last, li last line where we're using the compression, compression two, uh, basically we save, um, let's say, well, 10 megabytes. Uh, now, given that it's compressed, that also means that whenever we run, we need to uncompress. So there you need to basically uh, do the math and see if it's really needed to uh, use compression too, just to save 10 megabytes to try to reduce the startup time. And my observation shows that it's better to uh, not compress stuff at this stage. We have any anyway very lightweight uh, image. 41 megabytes is super light for a GRE that runs our uh, serverless Java function. So let's have a look at that, uh, how it works in FN. So, I um, can kill that guy. So we're, we're gonna create um, a Java function that is using JLink, so I will give it a very meaningful name. Uh, so uh, JLink, so let's see, JLink, so JLink minus init. I will give it a very meaningful name, name uh, JLink. Oops, sorry, typo. That wasn't me, that was the keyboard. JLink. Yeah, you see. So if we look at that function, we have again a func.yaml, a pom.xml, and so on and so on. So let's deploy that. Minus app. Uh, the app is BCN, the function is JLink, and verbose, and let's not push that to the registry just to save some time. So you see here that this time to build a function, we are using a uh, JLink. So, uh, and it's, it's pretty easy. So what happened is that we are using two, two tools. Well, FN is using two tools. So it first used JDEPS, which basically gives us all the dependency of the function. So if we look here, we have the function.jar, which is basically uh, the artifact of the function. And all the modules are passed to JLink to build us um, a GRE, a custom GRE. That is not, that doesn't have uh, header files and so on, and that is using a compression too, which uh, I would advise you to not do that. If we look at the size of now this, so we can first invoke that, so uh, BCN JLink. That's again a very uh, basic function, so tell me which day. So echo minus N, uh, we're on Monday, I think. If I invoke uh, BCN JLink. And on Monday, you should get back to work. Uh, sorry. So now, the thing is that we can look at the size of this function. For that, I'm using dive. And so those are the, the layers of my uh, function. So the first layer for point one is Alpine. That's uh, the operating system layer. We then have these 2.4 layers. And if we look at that layers, that's basically this one. Oops, sorry. So that's basically uh, the function. So function.jar, that's the function itself. And then all, all its dependency. And then we have this 33 megabyte, which is our custom GRE. So FN GRE. So it includes all the modules and just the modules that are needed to run uh, the function. 
And we also have this 29 uh, kilobyte, which is just a share object that is needed by, um, by FN. 29 kilobyte. So basically, at the end of the day, you see that 40, 40 megabyte, oops, sorry, let's say 40 megabyte here. We have a uh, several Java function uh, container image that include the operating system, uh, the Java runtime, and uh, the function uh, itself with all its dependency use. So that's something that is key when it comes to startup time, obviously. And you see that, well, to create that in uh, FN, the only thing that I had to use is this uh, init image command. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. So we can go further than that. We can use Graal. So, uh, well, so Graal is an open source, high performance polyglot virtual machine uh, developed by Oracle, by Oracle Labs. And one of the capabilities that uh, really helps here is the native image capability of Graal. So the idea with native image is basically it takes uh, a Java application, so Java bytecode, and that uh, Java application will be compiled into native uh, binary executable. And the idea is that it, well, that will reduce not only the startup time, but that will also improve the memory consumption. So, to do that in FN, so again, init image, but this time we're gonna use native init, and we're gonna uh, give the function a different name. And it's all it takes. So, I, I deploy my, my my uh, Graal uh, function, so my Java Graal uh, function, that, that will take a bit more time because it will f first be built into uh, Java code uh, and then uh, nat the native image capability of Graal, that's what we see here, we will basically turn that into a Linux executable. Um, well, we will come back to that. So it, it takes like two minutes. So, RAL VM demo, so we're good. So, la low latency, high performance. So, as I said at the beginning, Java has this reputation of slow startup time, but I think that we have uh, a lot of techniques and tools that we can use to basically make sure that Java can be used to write serverless function where we expect to have uh, a very quick startup time. So, there are optimizations that are done at the Java layers, but as you saw, there are also things that we need to handle at the pure containers layers. And we're basically uh, thinking care of, of that. Now let's quickly talk about the GVM ecosystem that we're living. So you know that every six months we have a new Java release. Um, there's Java the language, but there's also Kotlin, Groovy, Scala, and so on. Um, and then there are adjacent projects such as GraalVM. So that's something that we wanted to address within FN. So uh, we have this capability, which is init image, whoops, where basically we have the ability to easily uh, add support for new language. That's something that you can use to add support for uh, su language that are not supported by the platform, like .NET. Someone from the community has added support for .NET. And that's something that we're using on our side to also cope with the uh, Java ecosystem. So, it's still going on. It's almost done. So, um, well, what is going on? So the, the, you saw me using the init image for uh, jailing for an, uh, Graal. So basically, the parameter that is passed to uh, this init image uh, uh, flag is basically a Docker image that will produce all the artifacts for that given uh, project or a language. So, um, for example, you can write Kotlin function. If you if you give it the right uh, Kotlin init image, you will have the ability to write Kotlin function. So we are done. So you see 100 and some, something seconds, so basically to build our uh, function using Graal. So if we dive again to this uh, function, it's obviously lighter. So 4.4 is the operating system, and then we have this 16 megabyte uh, binary, which is just the function. So it's a native Linux executable that includes everything. So you see the function itself, but also Substrate VM, because we're, you need to remember that we are starting from Java code. So basically our Java application expects to have, for example, some kind of memory management that is provided by Substrate VM that is embedded in that uh, Linux uh, binary. So that's basically Graal in action. And we still have this uh, 19 kilobyte 
and you see that if we are using RAL, we are down to 21 megabyte. Now it's up to you to uh, decide which approach you want to use because obviously, uh, for example, the GC that we have with Graal is not as performant as the GC that we have on the hotspot side. But given that we're talking about short running application, maybe it's better to use that approach. So let's quickly create a final application and this time we're gonna use the init image, but we're gonna use Java 13, I said 13 init. So it's again um, a Java function, but this time uh, it uses Java 13. And to prove that it's indeed Java 13, let's just do that. So uh, let's see, var ttt uh, system get property Java Java dot version, and so it should be good. Yeah, get property, yeah. And when I was started to programs, I was always told to use meaningful variable names. Variable. So now we can do that in Java. So, uh, yeah, that's a bad joke, I know. BCN, uh, Duke, no, I don't have to specify. Verb. Well, let's just and if I didn't make any typo if we invoke this function that just prints uh, the version of the GVM that is used fn invoke bcn duke 13 and 13 early access so that's basically the init image capability that we're using for Kotlin, for Graal, for, uh, well, for everything those days. And that's something that you can also use. So with GVM ecosystem, I think that it's fair that we can easily cope with that uh, ecosystem uh, now. So serverless Java, does it have a feature? Absolutely. We think that it's just the beginning of uh, Java within the serverless space. So today we've discussed uh, FN, which is an open source fast platform, but to be fair, there are other open source fast platforms platform that also support Java. And all of them are, are obviously using uh, OpenGDK, and some are also looking at, at using RAL. So we think that Java in the serverless space has a bright future. So with that, we have like two minutes for questions. So is there any questions? Remarks? So, the call to action, everything is, is on GitHub, github.com slash fnprojectfn. Give it a try. You only need to have a Docker running on, on your machine and in less than two minutes, you will have the ability, uh, so the platform will be running on your machine and you will have the ability to deploy and run your fir first function. So please give it a try. And if you like it, give us a star. It doesn't cost anything, but that's always highly appreciated. So if there are no questions, I'd like to thank you for your time. So, gracias. <laughs>